Hi, I'm Ann Yoder. I am a professor of biology at Duke University, and for 13 years, I was the director of the Duke Lemur Center. I like to think of myself as a working conservation biologist. And when I say that to people, they wanna know what does that mean? And in fact, I have students ask me all the time, if I want to be a conservation biologist, what is the best way that I can do that? And what I typically tell them is that there are sort of two tracks that you can choose from to use your work and help to save biodiversity on Earth. Um, the first track is what I like to think of as sort of on the ground. Uh, you work with local people, you help them understand the issues uh, surrounding the preservation of forests, but you have to, of course, take their needs into account as well because they are trying to make a living, they're trying to feed their families, they're trying to do all of the things that we're all trying to do. So it's on you to learn from them and to help them learn from you. So that's what I call on the ground, and that probably is the most direct way to affect change in the, in the conservation setting. The way I approach it is what I like to call evidence-based conservation biology. And what do I mean by that? Well, I like to be the best scientist I can be, and I like to use my science to understand the evolution of life on Earth and to use that information to inform conservation practices. So to feed that to the people on the ground so that when they undertake their conservation action, they're doing it from a place of understanding what the natural conditions have been and should be. So for the entirety of my career, really, I have been focused on Madagascar. Uh, Madagascar is the world's fourth largest island, and it holds, even though it's just a very small landmass on the entirety of the Earth's surface area, it contains an extraordinary amount of biodiversity. And so we call it a, a biodiversity hotspot because it is both highly biodiverse and it is also highly threatened. So as a biologist, I want to understand how that diversity came to exist and to understand the evolutionary processes that have generated both the diversity and the distribution of that diversity so that we can try to approximate that with our conservation actions. So to do this, we like to use genomes. So genomes are, you can think of genomes as sort of data loggers of history, of time. Um, and every organism has a genome so we use those genomes from those organisms to understand things like how long have they been on the planet uh, what are their closest relatives how, where have they been on the planet have they been in large numbers in small numbers were they once in large numbers that are now shrinking um, have they been extirpated from particular areas of Madagascar? And these are lessons that are not just specific to Madagascar, but can be applied globally to any biodiverse uh, area that is under threat from human activities. So using this information helps us understand what is the natural condition. And I like to think of it as, you know, mother nature likes to have her way. She has her idea of how things should be, how plants should be distributed, how the animals should be distributed and in what abundances. So by understanding what nature prefers, we can try to mimic that when we're undertaking our conservation practices. So I think everyone knows that nature is under severe threat from all sorts of uh, reasons, uh, largely human impacts, uh, both immediate like deforestation and longer term like anthropogenic uh, climate change. So we all want to make things right. We want to help mother nature persist in the way that is uh, predestined by evolution. So to do this, we have only limited resources. I mean, if we had infinite resources, we could take it all on, but we can't. We only have limited resources, so we have to make careful decisions about the types of actions that we want to take in order to restore or protect 
the natural patterns that evolution has produced over millions and millions and millions of years. The goal for me is to come from a place of scientific evidence. So we want to understand this evolutionary history and apply that to our conservation practices. And in Madagascar in particular, it is iconic for the destructive influences of humans on the planet. Now, this is a complicated situation because the Malagasy people are simply trying to live their lives in a way that makes sense for their families and for themselves. But the sort of unintended consequence of their behaviors is that the forests are disappearing. And so we want to help the Malagasy do the right thing by the forest. And so this is where the on the ground comes in. Our evidence-based conservation action helps them do that. One of the really fascinating questions right now regarding conservation biology in Madagascar is to what extent is the currently high plateau savanna grassland a natural feature of the landscape? So the long held belief about Madagascar is that at, before humans arrived, and they arrived only very recently, anywhere from 2000 to 10,000 years ago. So it's one of the most recently colonized parts of the world. But the, the traditional belief is that Madagascar was forested all the way from the north to the south, to the east, to the west. And then humans arrived and very rapidly extirpated the forests of the central part of the island. What we see now is a very, what looks to our eyes to be a very uh, diminished landscape that's largely grassland. So the question is, is that grassland strictly the result of human activities or is it a natural feature of Madagascar's landscape? And this is a really important question. So in my group, we first came to question this this long-held belief about the grasslands being entirely the result of human activities when we were studying uh, mouse lemurs, of all things. Uh, so we were interested in looking at the evolutionary history of mouse lemurs, how long they had been in various places, and what their, uh, what their various evolutionary patterns have been. Uh, this is work that I did with a graduate student who recently finished in my lab, Ryan Campbell, and what we found was really interesting. So the mouse lemur populations that we observe sort of in the north and on this sort of highly fragmented landscape of the savanna, it, their genomes, the data loggers, showed us that they had actually been in fragmented distributions for tens of thousands of years. So this was their natural state. This then goes counter to the idea that this would have been entirely forested. Now, if we compare this fragmented pattern in the north of you know, these mouse lemurs that live in the open savanna with those in the south, one species that lives in the very wet forest of eastern Madagascar and its very close relative that lives in the dry forest of western Madagascar, and in between there is, there is no forest presently. But what we see is that about 50,000 years ago, they were actually connected. So we used a program called Space Mix, which generates a map of the distribution of genetic patterns for the organism that you're interested in. So this is how we came to understand two things. One, that in the north, this fragmented landscape was a very long standing, and in the south, at one time, probably 50,000 years ago, there were forests connecting the east and the west, but they disappeared naturally. So this was so long ago, there is absolutely no way that humans were the cause of the disappearance of this forest. So to go further, to further understand what the natural pattern is in central Madagascar, we want to test these hypotheses that were generated from our study of mouse lemurs. Now, so how will we do that? And given that when we're looking at the patterns of the animals, they are, in a sense, reflecting the patterns of the forest or the, you know, the plants that they're living in. Um, so we thought, well, let's ask the plants what they have to say about this hypothesis. So to do this, 
I am now working with a postdoc in my lab, George Tiley, and a colleague of ours at Kew Botanical Gardens, Maria Varansova, who is a specialist in Malagasy grasses. And we're going to ask the grasses what they have to say about this hypothesis of long-term open habitat in the central part of Madagascar. And the very cool part of this is that the grasses have a unique physiological signature and that we can pick up with our genetic methods that will tell us whether a particular grass loves to be in a forest, so it's shade loving, or does it want to be in open habitat where it's exposed to the sun. We're going to look at both types of grasses and you know, do a deep dive into their evolutionary history. And from that, we can learn things like how long ago were there forests present in the central part of Madagascar? How long have the grasses been there? How, when did the sort of sun-loving open savanna grasses start to expand? Um, all of these things will inform our understanding of what the natural condition is for the central highland of Madagascar. So the reason that it's so important for us to understand what is the natural condition of the central highlands of Madagascar and other places on Earth, you know, where we do see open habitat, open grassland savanna, is because there is a global effort and a very well justified global effort to plant trees. We want to plant lots of trees. So the reason that we want to plant these trees is critically important because they serve as carbon sinks. So they can pull carbon from the atmosphere and store it in the earth and thus help mitigate the carbon driven climate change that is a consequence of our activities on earth. So if we're planting trees in Madagascar, we want to plant trees only where they belong. So reflecting back to mother nature has her preferences for where organisms should be and how they should be distributed. So if we were to make a mistake and plant trees where nature wants a grassland, this could be environmentally and ecologically devastating. For example, pretty much the only trees that would grow readily in the highland of Madagascar would be either pines or eucalyptus. These are not native to Madagascar. And not only are they not native and potentially invasive, but their ecological uh, requirements are such that they could be devastating to the landscape. Eucalyptus in particular are very thirsty trees. So they pull water forcefully out of the earth and so could desiccate the central plateau. And this could be very damaging for the agricultural practices of the native Malagasy because rice paddying is a very important uh, industry and critical food source for Madagascar. So if you're planting a bunch of eucalyptus trees on this natural grassland savanna, it's you know, drawing up the water and they burn very hot you could desiccate the environment, you could create forest fires that would be devastating, not only to the central highlands, but also to the uh, neighboring rainforest or the dry forest of the West. So this would be uh, very ill-advised. So at the end of the day, we want to take the data that we have generated in the lab and hand it to the people on the ground in Madagascar, the stakeholders in Madagascar, the conservation planners, so that they can take an evidence-based approach to their conservation actions. And we think it's this kind of partnership between the lab and the people on the ground that is what is really going to affect long-term change and hopefully protect in perpetuity, the extraordinary biodiversity that exists in Madagascar. Mm -hmm.